Saturday. 
And so when you look at Exodus chapter 16 and elsewhere in the Old Testament, what you find is a lot of emphasis put on the Sabbath, as we would understand it to be Saturday. And certainly college football places a lot of emphasis on the Saturday, on the Sabbath, on Saturday. But in the Old Testament, it was much more than that. There was a whole lot more going on in the Sabbath than just simply people hanging out on just another day of the week. It was a special day. And certainly when you look in Exodus, the 20th chapter, for instance, in verse 8, and what we would commonly describe as the Ten Commandments, God made the Sabbath and the Fourth Commandment to be a very special day under the Old Covenant. He said, take the Sabbath day, make it holy, and make sure you keep the Sabbath always. Now, the Jews didn't always keep the Sabbath. There were times when they were immoral and they did other things, and the Sabbath wasn't really a priority. Other things fell by the wayside as well. The Passover, the feast days, the rituals, those types of things fell by the wayside. But what God had commanded these people to do on the Sabbath is to remember it, to keep it holy. You see in Exodus chapter 16, you see in Exodus the 20th chapter. There's even an injunction right after, actually an illustration, right after the Old Testament was authorized, you find in the book of Exodus, when a man is found on the Sabbath gathering sticks, which seems like a very simple, a very, a very understandable type of action. And God commands that that person that's out on the Sabbath gathering sticks is to be put to death, which seems extreme. But the reason that God does that is he wants them to understand that the Sabbath day is something that you should keep and that you should make holy. Now, we as Christians in 2016 do not keep the Sabbath. I do not keep the Sabbath. I actually worked all day yesterday building something for Logan's Playroom that I would have rather taken the day off and done nothing instead. I would have loved to have kept the Sabbath yesterday. But we in today's world do not keep it. We certainly don't keep it in the sense of a religious tone. So the question I have for you this morning is, why did it switch? Why, as, or why, whereas we used to keep the Sunday or the Sabbath and make sure that was holy, that was our day of worship, why did we all of a sudden switch it to Sunday? And that's what we want to look at this morning. I will tell you before we go any further that there are people in today's world that do believe that you still need to keep the Sabbath. These people you probably have heard of, these people are named Seventh-day Adventists. And where Seventh-day Adventism came about was in the mid-18th century by a guy named William Miller. He was the founder of a movement called Adventism, which Adventism, kind of a loose definition, at least as far as I understand it, is looking towards something. And so what Adventism revolved around was, especially in the religious Adventism, was looking towards the coming of the Christ. Keep in mind, the mid-18th century, all up until the end of the 18th century, there's a lot of religious fervor. You have a lot of, the First Great Awakening was happening, the Second Great Awakening, the beginning of the 19th century, a lot of religious fervor. A lot of people really amped up about their new beliefs that they can have as part of this new government, this new country. And so there was a lot of energy going on. William Miller, though, prophesied towards the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, that there was going to be this day when Jesus would come back and that it was going to be on, I think, August 17th. And if you actually look at William Miller's calculations that he uses in Revelation to try and decide on that day, it's actually pretty interesting. It's totally off base and totally not what the scriptures teach, but it's very fascinating to find the way that he arrived at this conclusion. Obviously, though, when August 17th came, Jesus did not come back, and so they thought, well, we'll push it six months in the future. And obviously he didn't come back then. That was the moment at which people looked at the Adventist movement, and they said to themselves, this probably isn't truthful. This guy probably wasn't accurate in this. He certainly wasn't accurate in this. Probably wasn't accurate in other things as well. One of the people, though, that followed William Miller very closely was this woman by the name of Ellen White. And Ellen White was a very close disciple of William Miller. She believed in a lot of things she had to say. And she kind of had one of these splinter sects that went off and took a bunch of followers with her. And what Ellen White believed was not only that there was this need to hasten the coming of Jesus, but also that much of the Old Testament was embodied within that. Keep in mind that a lot of Adventist, a lot of millennial type of ideas are very much embodied within Jewish methodology. For instance, the millennial reign of Christ, dietary laws, those types of things, very common amongst a lot of these Old Testament Adventist type movements. A lot of similarity between those two. And what Ellen White believed in a nutshell was that she believed that, the, or that Jesus was going to come back at some point but that also the Old Testament seeped into the New, and that you had to keep both alongside of each other. And Ellen White, along with the other Seventh-day Adventists, started to push for a lot of these Old Testament types of leanings. For instance, she believed that there was no hell, a doctrine that we would apply, apply to or describe today as the annihilation of the soul. I think the Mormons believe that as well. 
But she believed that there was no hell. She believed that you had salvation by faith alone, that works played zero part in that, but that you were saved by faith alone. She also believed in the millennial reign of Christ, that Jesus would literally reign a thousand years in this utopian type of society in which everybody would get along and everybody would worship Jesus. She also advocated, and I found this most interesting because I did not know this, she also advocated avoiding unclean meats. And so all the dietary laws you find in the Old Testament, she said you still need to keep those. And I think there's even some Seventh-day Adventists in today's world that are full-on vegetarians. They just take all meats out of the equation. And so you see a lot of these Old Testament type leanings starting to kind of branch into New Testament teachings. And the admonition by them is you have to keep parts of the Old Testament and you have to keep the New Testament into kind of this conglomeration of a religion. That's it in a nutshell. But where Ellen White's teachings start to take more of a prophetic, more of a future type reign, is in her discussion of the book of Revelation. And Ellen White believed, for instance, that Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10, which talk about the two beasts. And I'm no expert on Revelation. You can talk to Howard. You can talk to Paul later if you want to talk about Revelation. I'm not an expert. But she claims that the two beasts that are in Revelation, the land beast and the sea beast, one is talking about the nation of Rome, and that the other talks about the United States. Now, I don't see the United States anywhere in Revelation chapter 13. I think when the two beasts are described there in that book, in that chapter, you have one that describes the imperial power of Rome, has a grip on it, and then you also have the religious side of Rome, which was embodied with the emperor worship and that type of pagan mythology. Both of those things played hand in hand. I think that's what's going on there in Revelation. But Ellen White viewed one of those beasts in Revelation as being Rome, the other one being the USA. Now she believed, for instance, that the USA had been corrupted by a whole bunch of things. And if she didn't believe that they had been corrupted already, she viewed that time as quickly coming. Keep in mind a couple of statements that came straight from her book called The Great Controversy. I took this straight from her words. She said the statement that the beast with two horns, that's one of the beasts that's their revelation, causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast indicates that the authority of this nation is to be exercised in enforcing some observance which shall be an act of homage to the papacy. Now she claims that the USA alongside the Pope, the Catholic Church, that they're all together and that the USA kind of with this patriotic religious movement is hanging out with the Catholic Church and they're, for lack of a better phrase, they're unifying with each other. That what the Catholic Church does, the USA endorses, the USA does is kind of an act of kind of an act of appropriation or convenience towards the Catholic Church. I'm not trying to use these words. I'm trying to put it in a way that makes sense to me. But she believes that the Catholic Church and the U.S. are kind of in cahoots with each other. And so she claimed that anything that the USA did can be interpreted as some kind of act of patronage to the papacy, to the Pope, to the Catholic Church, which she believes is just the biggest abomination that has ever touched humankind. Now, I would agree on some levels. I think the Catholic Church has a lot of things that are very negative. I think it's a great heresy what a lot of them are doing. She takes that idea and she explodes on it and says that any type of association anybody has with any Catholic Church is blasphemy and a betrayal of Jesus Christ himself. That's where she goes with it. But anyway, she carries on the same idea, not only saying this about this idea of the USA and the papacy kind of being in cahoots with each other, she also has this to say. It has been shown that the United States is the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns. You see that in Revelation 13. And that this prophecy will be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance, which Rome claims as the special acknowledge of her supremacy. This is the important quote to grasp. If you've heard nothing else in the last five minutes, pay attention to this. I can understand if you haven't, by the way, because I'm formulating these thoughts in my mind as they're coming out of my mouth right now. But focus on this quote, because this is the one that really matters. The way that Ellen White observes or views Sunday observance is as a contamination of true Christian worship, which should have always been on the Sabbath. And the way that she ascribes the United States' participation in this is that the United States will enact a Sunday observance because the Catholic Church told them to. Now, what's interesting about this is Ellen White exists in the beginning of the 19th century. Blue Laws, which describes this idea of not working on Sunday or not working on a specific day of the week, those were in effect by 1750. And so her blue laws were already in effect by the time that she was talking about this. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, several blue laws are still in existence. For instance, did you know that if you owned a car dealership in Texas, you have to be closed one of the two days on the weekend, either Saturday or Sunday. You can't be open both. You have to be closed one of those. 
That's evidence of this blue law that she's observing or that she's talking about. And so what Ellen, White's what Ellen White believes is that the U.S. is going to enact a statute, some kind of law, that will enable people that are paganly worshiping the Pope, or paganly worshiping the Catholic Church, who wants to meet on Sunday, that they're going to act a law which caters to that. In other words, the U.S. is aiding the Catholic Church by allowing everybody to have Sunday off of work. That's what Ellen White believes. You can see that there's a lot of things that are interesting about this segment. Certainly if you were to read the Great Controversy, which I didn't, I read quite a bit of it this week, I didn't read all of it. But when you read the Great Controversy, it's a pretty passionate type of plea. It's a very zealous, it's a very emotionally charged book. And what's interesting about not only Ellen White's position is that her followers, those people who ascribe to the Seventh-day Adventist teaching, most of you probably know of you, but most of them are very zealous by themselves. And the reason most of them are very zealous, very passionate, very emphatic about these types of beliefs is they believe that a Sunday worship or anything else that even has a hint of Catholicism is a handshake with the devil himself. Ellen White believed that Sunday observance was condemnable by heresy. She believed that other things were condemnable because of their so-called association with the Catholic Church. And so if you ever meet Seventh-day Adventists, which I've known several, most of them have been fantastic individuals. But one of the things that you'll notice about them is they're very, very zealous and very passionate about certain key subjects. That's what you find within a lot of the Seventh-day Adventist sects. So the question then comes up when you're talking about Seventh-day Adventists, by the way, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas in 1993 were an offshoot of Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists disavowed that group, but they're an offshoot and example of what that can eventually become. So when we're asking the question about Sunday or Saturday, why are we worshiping on Sunday as opposed to Saturday? There's a really large religious group that believes the Sabbath needs to be worshipped, that believe that there's no other day to worship except the Sabbath. Why do we worship on the Sunday? Why do we worship on Sunday at all? And I think that's the honest question that we need to get at this morning. When we talk about this subject, we can't look at it without talking about the very fact that the commandment to worship on the Sabbath, the commandment Worship on Saturday was part of the old law. We need to get that fact in place first. Secondly, we need to understand that the old law was done away with. This is probably something that many of us are familiar with, this idea of the Old Testament being fulfilled, but it bears repeating in this instance because of one of the repercussions of it. Look at Matthew, the fifth chapter, for instance. Matthew, chapter 5. By the way, I do want to point out not only right now, but I want to point it out at the end if I can remember again. Any of my notes, any of the quotes, any things that we use this morning, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about them. You can have copies of them if, you, if we're going too quickly through them. But please don't hesitate to ask me because I do want, I don't want to be misunderstood. I want this information to come across in the manner that it should. In Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17, Jesus is having this discussion in the Sermon on the Mount, teaching what was largely probably 99% of his audience at this point, Jews. He's answering a charge that many had brought up to him, which is, you're saying that the Old Testament was useless. It's a similar charge they brought against Paul all throughout the book of Acts. But in Matthew, the fifth chapter, starting verse 17, he answers this charge. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. That's a very, very, very important two-verse section. Because what Jesus is saying in answer to this charge of, you think the Old Testament is useless and you're trying to do away with it, there's a difference between what Jesus was trying to do, what Jesus did, and what they were accusing him of. Their argument was, you think the Old Testament is useless, that we should never read it and never study from it ever again. It wasn't Jesus' point. The point Jesus was getting at in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, is that the Old Testament finds its fulfillment within the new law. That's the whole point that he's getting at. Everything that you read in the Old Testament, the laws, the prophecies, everything about that points towards Christ. And since it's fulfilled, it's no longer applicable in today's world. That was the charge that was brought up towards Paul on numerous occasions, which Paul had nothing but the utmost of respect for the old law. But the old law had a purpose. The old law had a reason for its existence in the first place, and that was to point towards Christ and to point towards his church. In Acts the 15th chapter, for instance, whenever this discussion kind of comes more into full view, you had this argument that was going back and forth between Jews and Gentiles, 
And this argument that was going back and forth between Jews and Gentiles was, are we still obligated to keep the Old Testament or not? Now they embodied that within the argument about circumcision. But the real discussion there in Acts 15 was, should we keep the Old Testament alongside the New Testament? That was the discussion. And so all the apostles, the elders, got together in Acts the 15th chapter and started discussing that. You see that here in verse 1. It says, Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That was their contention. You see that in the Judaizing teachers that Paul would deal with for a long time in his epistles. Verse 2, when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders there concerning this issue. So let's get together and talk about this. The question is, do you need to be circumcised according to the law of Moses in order to be saved? Let's all get together and let's talk about this. If it's a matter of salvation, it's a matter of faith, we need to get it right. Look starting in verse 6 of the same chapter. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to the brethren, You know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith, which circumcision did that at least a little bit, is separate between Jew and Gentile. Verse 10, Now therefore, why do you put God to the test? by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. So there's Peter's response back to this. People are saying, well, you need to be circumcised according to the law of Moses, or you cannot be saved. And what Peter puts to the test here is this idea, and puts to rest the idea, or this idea here in verses 6 through 11, because he says, all of us have been trying for 2,000 years to keep the law perfectly, and none of us have succeeded. Why then are we going to transfer that responsibility and put it on Gentiles who were never God's people in the first place? And he says, we believe there in verse 8, or verse 11, we believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. That's part of the bigger discussion. But what he's saying there in that verse is, we couldn't keep the old law. And so why are we trying to force the Gentiles to? And what you find throughout the rest of Acts chapter 15 is this discussion about how we're going to graft the Gentiles in and make them one church, at least accommodatively, with the Jews. Look towards Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is where I think we should spend probably all of our time. We're not, just in case you're a little bit worried with that. Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law. And Paul writes very um, logically. He writes very deeply. And so a lot of the things that he says in Romans are pretty complex. So read back through this. I had to read through this at least 347 times in order to fully grasp what he was saying. Read Romans 7, verses 1 through 4 a few times to get what he's talking about. Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 1, he says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, in other words, Jews, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, then she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Right there in verses 1 through 3, in a nutshell, is the marriage covenant that you find in other places. Now, there's a lot more we can talk about this. But what Romans 7, 1 through 3 teaches is the idea that two people are married and then one person decides to go marry somebody else. And I understand there's a lot more involved than what I'm just talking about right here. But if one person decides to go marry somebody else while the other person is still living, the divorce wasn't for the cause of adultery, all those types of things, that person decides to go marry somebody else, then what that person has done is commit adultery within that marriage covenant. The discrepancy that he's saying is there in verse 3. But he says that if one of those spouses dies, that other person can go marry whomever they want to because that other spouse has died and they are free from that marriage covenant. Now look at verse 4 because he makes, he makes a law of grace type of application. Therefore, my brethren, you also are made to die to the law for the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who is raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit from God. What's his point? 
His point there in Romans 7 is not necessarily to talk about marriage. He does talk about it, but that's not his point in talking about it. What he's describing there in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4 is, is just as if a person is joined to another person while their other spouse still lives, divorce wasn't for the cause of adultery, then that person has committed adultery within that marriage covenant. His point in talking about that with the law is, if we're still married to the law, if we're still under the law, and then we decide that we're going to go join ourselves to the law of Christ, what we've done in essence is commit spiritual adultery. And that's the argument that he's making here. The only way that we can be joined to the law of Christ is if that first law was dead in the first place. You understand what I'm saying? And that's what he's driving at when he talks about these things. You cannot be joined to the law of Christ and to the law of Moses at the same time because that would be adultery. The only way that you can be joined to the law of Christ is if the law of Moses had died, had been, done, put, had been put away with. That's his argument there in Romans 7. chapter. So when we're discussing this idea of the Old Testament being fulfilled, being put to the side in favor of the law of Christ, that's what we need to understand before anything else, is that we're not addressing this idea that we just don't like the Old Testament, we're putting it to the side because it, was, it, it didn't really fit with our modern day narrative. That's not the point of that. The point is, the old law was fulfilled, it's been done away with, and now we're under the law of Christ. And if things in the Old Testament are repeated in the New Testament then we follow them by virtue of the fact that they're in the New Testament and not because they were in the Old Testament. A lot of people have made a big deal about this whole idea of you know, nine of the Ten Commandments or nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament. You know the only one that's missing? is the Sabbath day. But some people have said because of that, well, in order or because of this, because that nine of the ten have been repeated in the New Testament, that means we need to keep all ten of them. That's not true at all. The fact that God said you shall not have any other gods besides me the fact that he said you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, which talks about covetousness and then adultery. The fact that he says you shall not murder. The fact that those are repeated in the New Testament, that's not the big deal. If he wanted us to keep the Sabbath, he would have said also in the New Testament, keep the Sabbath. We don't keep the 9 out of the 10 because they're in the Old Testament. We keep them because they're in the New Testament, if that makes any sense. This is important to grasp, because when we're talking about the whole Sabbath day, the Old Testament being put away with, this is an important point to grasp. Because what a lot of people will try to do is say, well, we need to keep the Old Testament alongside the New Testament. The old law has been put away with. But let's ask the question, what if we still want to live under the Old Covenant? Go to Galatians, the fifth chapter. What if we still, for whatever reason, because we just like not mixing our textiles, or because we like sacrificing goats the Sabbath day, or whatever the situation is, what if we just want to keep the Old Testament? Galatians chapter 5 has a warning for all of us. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 2. He says, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, which is part of the old law, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. Verse 4, you have been severed from Christ. You are seeking to justify by law. You have fallen from grace. Did you see what he says there in verse 3? If you highlight or underline, verse 3 is perfect for this. Because what he says there is, if you desire to keep the old law, you have to keep the whole law. You can't just keep the Sabbath day because you like it. You can't just keep the mixing of textiles because you like it. If you say to yourself, I'm going to go out and I'm going to keep the law of Moses, then you had better keep all of it. And not just cherry pick things that you feel like you want to implement into the New Testament. And this is ultimately my problem with religious groups that really try to grab hold of the Sabbath day and say we need to celebrate on the Sabbath because the Jews did it. If you want to celebrate on the Sabbath because the Jews did it, then you need to offer Old Testament sacrifices because they did. You need to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year for the Feast of the Tabernacles, for the Feast of uh, or for Passover, or for the other one that I can't remember right now because I'm on a roll. But you had better keep the whole old law. Because as James 2 and verse 10 talks about, if you keep the whole law and yet stumble in one, then you have you are guilty of the entire law. So people that say to themselves, well, I think we should worship on the Sabbath because the Jews did it. Where are your animal sacrifices? Where are your Levitical customs? Where are your priesthood? Where is all the things that you need? Where are all the things that you need to have a fully functional Old Covenant 
an Old Testament system. They're not here anymore. And that's Paul's point. And that's my point this morning. You can't just cherry pick something out of the Old Testament and say to yourself, I'm now going to bind this as authoritative because it was authoritative 2,000 years ago. That's not how the law works. And thanks be to God, by the way, that that's not how it works anymore. Because Paul grappled with all of that throughout the book of Romans and talks about how he never once was able to keep the old law. And I'll tell you this, as much as we might think to ourselves how great we are, if Paul can't keep the old law, then I doubt seriously that I can. And that probably anybody else here can as well. The second reason, I tried to find ways that we could kind of group these into major subheadings. The second one, it's not as authoritative as the first, but it is something to think about. It's the apostolic example that we have throughout Scripture. There are three ways that we derive authority from the Scripture. The way that we study the Bible, the three ways that we derive authority. Number one, by a direct command that God gives us. If He says, do this, then you better do that. The second way is through necessary inference. You're reading something, and there's no other way for this text to be explained except through this explanation. That's a necessary inference. And the third one is through an apostolic example. We see the apostles doing it, and so we mimic that same type of behavior. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Remember what he said in 1 Thessalonians, keep the traditions just as I have handed them down to you. That's a form of apostolic example. What's our apostolic example for this? For meeting on Sunday? You find it twice in the New Testament, explicitly. Acts chapter 20, and verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and verse 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you do also. On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save, as he may prosper, that no collections be made when I come. What you have in Acts chapter 20 and 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, is an apostolic example for meeting on the first day of the week. They did it, and so we do it also. Now you may say to yourself, well, they did it on the first day of the week, but I can do it whenever I feel like. We counter with that point. They did it here. And we have two references in the scripture where they did it on Sunday. What's your authority for doing it any day of the week? Any other day of the week? Paul did it on Sunday. The apostles did it on Sunday. So what authority do you have that supersedes what we read in scripture? And I think that's an honest question that we ask ourselves. Remember, John, when he's in the book of Revelation, Roman, or Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Same concept. I was in the spirit on Sunday. Keep in mind, too, that Christians celebrated, <coughs> excuse me, Christians celebrated on the Lord's Day. You see this several times in early quotes. Some people will make the argument that Christians never worshipped on Sunday before 325 AD, which is when Constantine issued an edict, issuing what was, in essence, an early form of blue laws. And that's just blatantly not true. There are websites out there, and I won't name any by names, there are websites out there that you can read that preach Sabbath following the Sabbath, that are filled with nothing but propaganda, that are just filled with one person's agenda. And some people will say that there was no worship on Sunday apart, or no worship on Sunday before 325 BC, that's just not, or 325 AD, that's just not true. Ignatius, who was a direct contemporary of John the Apostle, direct contemporary of John the Apostle, in circa 50 to 117 AD, he said, we have seen how former adherents of the ancient customs have since attained to a new hope, so that they have given up keeping the Sabbath, and now order their lives by the Lord's Day instead. And then he builds on this thought, the idea of calling it the Lord's Day. The day when life first dawned for us, thanks to him and to death. That death, though some deny it, is the very mystery which has moved us to become believers. And endure tribulation, prove ourselves pupils of Jesus Christ, our sole teacher. Now there's a subtext within this that Ignatius talks about that is very interesting. Because when he describes this idea of the Lord's Day being the day with which we have our new birth, He's talking explicitly about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And through that resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's how we have our hope. But you know what that also is a parallel of? The first day of creation. And just as the Old Testament tries to issue the, or makes the Sabbath as authoritative as a day of rest, because it was the day God rested, you can say the same thing about the first day. That God created life on the first day. And to mirror that, we also worship on the first day. But the emphasis that Ignatius puts on is the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened on Sunday, happened on the Lord's Day. That's the day that we come together 
to celebrate and to worship him. Justin Martyr, who was also famous in the second century AD. This is a little bit longer. I can give these quotes to you later if you want me to. Keep in mind that the terms that sometimes they use were a little different than what we've described. Them. Focus on, though, what they're talking about. It says, on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in this country gathered together in one place. And the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. As long as time permits, then, when the reader has ceased, the president, and keep in mind that translation of terms, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly, because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world. There's that subtext with the nauseous that we talked about. And when Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day rose from the dead, for he was crucified on the day before that of Saturn, Saturday, and on the day after that of Saturn, which is the day of the sun, Saturday and Sunday. Having appeared to his apostles and disciples, he taught them these things, which we have submitted to you also for your consideration. What Justin Martyr does, in large respect, is parrot exactly what Ignatius says, which is the fact that we gather on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, because that is the day that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And so we gather together on the first day of the week to commemorate, to worship, to honor that day, honor him on that day, which we did this morning with the Lord's Supper. But somebody would say, especially when you look at Justin Martyr's argument, some people would say, looking at that, well, because Saturday and Sunday, these are just pagan festivals that the Catholic Church decided to weave into Christianity. I want you to focus on what Constantine actually said. A lot of people have made a big deal about what Constantine actually said. Look at what the edict that he actually put forth in 325 AD says. In AD 325, this is the edict that Constantine said. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and the people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops, workshops be closed. That's nothing but a more ancient version of what we have in today called the Blue Laws. And what Constantine said in this instance was, on this day, on Sunday, everything's going to be closed for whatever reason. He didn't expound on it, at least as far as I could tell, within the direct context of this quote. But what people have said is, well, Constantine switched the day from Sabbath to Sunday because he wanted to provide an opportunity for the pagan worshipers to worship Christ. This is that transference of the Holy Day from Sabbath to Sunday, and it was there to accommodate paganism. Nowhere in that is in Constantine. Was Constantine a Christian? I don't know. That's for God to judge. He obviously had Christian leanings. He was the first Christian that actually was friendly towards, or the first emperor that was friendly towards Christians. But nowhere in this edict does Constantine provide allowance either for paganism or for Christianity. And to try and interject this narrative into some religious overtone, quite frankly, distorts what Constantine had to say. Others would suggest that worshiping on Sunday is nothing more than pagan worship of the sun god. Tertullian talked about this. This wasn't an uncommon uh, accusation. He says others suppose that the sun is the god of the Christians because we make Sunday a day of festivity. Does that sound familiar to anybody? They're worshiping on Sunday. Obviously, they have to worship the day or the god of sun. He says we devote Sunday to rejoicing for a far different reason than the sun worship. People accuse Jesus in the New Testament of being cannibals because he said he must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And somebody could say, well, he's a cannibal because he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's just a misquotation of what Jesus said, a misattribution of what Jesus actually meant. And so people that would say, well, Christians were worshiping on Sunday, that's obviously because they were paganistic in origin. Tertullian himself, in 197 AD, said, I understand what you guys are saying, but if you were ever visit our worship services, they look nothing like the pagan rituals of the sun god. And still other people would say that what we need to do is we need to worship on Sunday or on Sunday because that's what the rest of the empire was engaged in. And I think Anatolius kind of speaks to that. He says, It should not be lawful to celebrate the Lord's mystery of Easter, there's that translation again, at any other time but on the Lord's day, the day in which the Lord's resurrection from death took place. We worship on Sunday for the exact same reason that they did. Not only because the apostles did it, but because on Sunday we worship through the Lord's Supper and remember Christ's death until he came. Still other people will say, well, the reason that, or we see, we see evidences in the New Testament of people worshiping on the Sabbath. You see evidence of Christians worshiping on the Sabbath. Three times you see this idea in the New Testament. Luke chapter 4, verse 16, when he says he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. 
Acts chapter 17, verse 2, according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Acts 18, verse 4, it's implied there as well. He was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now here's the question. Why did Paul go to the synagogue on the Sabbath? That's really the question. Was he there to worship or was he there to reason? We understand right from the foremost that he was there to reason with the Jews and the Greeks. That's why he was there in the first place. But keep in mind that Paul also, on top of being a Christian, he was also a Jew. And Paul had had the custom of going to the synagogue on the Sabbath from his earliest days. But what he did there did not negate anything that he did as a Christian. That was what he did. It was also, by the way, where the highest per capita amount of people that were God-fearing were located. And he knew that going into the synagogue on the Sabbath was, gave him the greatest chance to be able to talk to people. We have to ask the question, though, and this is what we'll end with. You can all collectively breathe this sigh of relief. This is the question that I have for you. What did the Jews, and if you listen to nothing else, listen to this. Actually, that's not true. Just listen to this. What did the Jews, or what were the Jews told to do on the Sabbath from the very beginning? And I think that's an honest question. We venerate, or people in today's world, the SDAs and other people, will venerate the Sabbath because they see it as the Jewish holy day of worship. But when you go back to the Old Testament and read what the Sabbath was about, it has nothing to do with that. It has some to do with that. But I want you to read exactly what went on in the Sabbath, on the Sabbath in the Old Testament. Flip back to Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter. Deuteronomy, chapter 5. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 5, we see various commandments surrounding the Sabbath. These two verses, I think, embody the spirit of it. And you can bring out more if you'd like, we can talk about those as well. But in Deuteronomy the 5th chapter, starting in verse 12, this is a repeat, more or less, of the Ten Commandments that was in Exodus. He expounds on it a little bit more. Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting in verse 12, he says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor, do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. There's where it is in the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath day. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your ox, your donkey, any of your cattle, your sojourner who stays with you, so that your male servant and your female servant will rest as well as you. Verse 15, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. There it is in the Ten Commandments. And that's where people in today's world will say, right there you see, God always wants the Sabbath day to be held holy. It was holy for these reasons, and we should keep it holy as well. What does that phrase even mean? When you look at God's commandment there in Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, the repeating of that commandment, when you look at what God told them to do, it didn't have anything to do with formal corporate worship, if I can use that phrase accommodatively. What was his only command on that day? To rest. It didn't have anything to do with coming to a place of worship and worshiping God at all. The only thing that he told them to do was to rest. Now it went alongside that with the end of that where you remember that you were slaves in Egypt, but that was much more personal than a corporate type worship that people would try to push in today's world. In Leviticus, look over there too. This is the second one. Someone would argue that Leviticus 24 expounds on this. And this is where you see the corporate worship. <coughs> but in Leviticus chapter 24, you see a very similar thing. Leviticus chapter 24, starting in verse 5. He says, You shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with the two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. Which, by the way, if you figure out what an ephah is, please let me know. I'm still trying to figure that out. Verse 6, you shall set them in two rows, six on a row and a pure gold tail before the Lord. You shall put pure frankincense on each row so that it may be a memorial portion for the bread, even an offering by the fire to the Lord. Verse 8, every Sabbath day he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. It is an everlasting covenant before the sons of Israel. So here's where you have people that say, well, the Sabbath individually is for rest. Here's the corporate aspect of it. And here's what they had to do. Make the bread, set on the tables, that type of thing. Look at the next verse in verse 9. It shall be for Aaron and his sons. And they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the Lord's offerings by fire, his portion forever. Who is this commandment ascribed to? Well, it's in the book of Leviticus, so you tell me. To Aaron and his sons. 
So the question then comes up, if we're going to keep the Sabbath day just as the Jews did, keep in mind, that's the phrase, if we're going to keep the Sabbath day just like they did, then what did they do? Deuteronomy chapter 24, they rested, and then according to Leviticus, or Deuteronomy chapter 5, and then according to Leviticus chapter 24, in the tabernacle worship, the Levites were to put out the bread. So if we're going to keep the Sabbath just like they did, it involves nothing more than a day of rest. And people will look at these verses and say, well, there was a synagogue established, and there was a synagogue that was there, that's where they all went to to read the scriptures, that type of thing. Synagogue worship didn't come around until the Babylonian exile. You're talking about a full 800 to 900 years after Moses existed. That synagogue worship even came onto the planet in the first place. So here's my question for you. To people who would say, well, we didn't keep the Sabbath like they did, and Sabbath involves worshiping on the Sabbath. Well, no, it doesn't. So let me ask you this. What did a Jew who lived in northern Israel, by the way, which is 100 miles from Judah, what did a Jew who lived in northern Israel before the time of the Babylonian captivity, which was... 606 BC. What did they do every Sabbath? What did their day consist of? And the answer, whenever you look at Deuteronomy and Leviticus, is very plain. They rested, unless they were a Levite, and then they baked bread and put it on the table of Shogun. That's the question, that's the answer that I have for you. So people that would say, well, we need to keep the worship just like they did, ask yourself, how did they actually keep it in the first place? Because I guarantee you, it's different than whatever it is people today are trying to teach you. Look at Genesis, or Galatians, the sixth chapter of it. This is the last verse that we'll read, I promise. And then you will have your own version of a Sabbath day. That's our day of rest. Okay, so that was a joke that went bad. Galatians chapter 6. You can make the argument that the whole book of Galatians is one big treatise on why the Old Testament is not authoritative anymore. It starts with Galatians 1, where he talks about, even though we are an angel from heaven, teach you anything different. It starts with that phrase. It goes all the way through the book of Galatians. You can talk about Hagar and Sinai, talk about Moses, a whole expose in chapters 3 and 4. But look at what he finishes off with here in Galatians chapter 6. He says those in verse 12, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh may compel you to be circumcised. And really, really focus in on this verse or this section. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh will try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. That's not me saying that. That's Paul saying that. Verse 13, for those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Verse 15, for neither is circumcision anything nor circumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And Paul adds this unto the end. In case you're looking for a distinguishing mark of you as a child of God, verse 17, from now on let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. You know what Paul dealt with over and over and over again? Were people that were trying to bind Old Testament laws on New Testament Christians and saying that you need to keep the law of Moses alongside the law of Christ. Paul dispelled that notion entirely in every single epistle, but he points to the motivation for people that do that right there. Because he says those people who would want you to be circumcised are not doing it so that you can be a glory to God. But so that you can be a glory to them. They want to have power over you. They want to, as he would say earlier in Galatians, spy out your liberty. And they want to bring you under a yoke that they don't even follow. Anybody that tries to bind the old law on New Testament Christians is self-absorbed especially when they try to make it a matter of faith. And that's what Paul ends Galatians chapter 6 with. He ends it very emotionally, he ends it very authoritatively, and he answers it very finally. We haven't talked this morning about what it takes to become a child of God. I'll tell you one thing it doesn't take, being circumcised, keeping the old law. What it takes is walking with God and being obedient to Him every step of the way, which involves being baptized into His death, being raised to walk in newness with Him. And being obedient to his laws, the laws that Christ set for us every second of every day, knowing that he's there for us whenever we slip and fall along that same path. If you're here this morning, I don't want you to be bothered. I don't want you to be torn down and downtrodden because of the perception that God is out there waiting for you to fall. God loves you. He wants you to be with him.
question is, do you want to be with him? That answer is yes, and we can help in any way. I would encourage you to come. Please stand. The sign of God was from above and from above. Yes, because of all of his wonderful love. Set me free.